I'm Nicole Burley. It is Wednesday, August 11th. This is Rush Hour. Those top stories in just a moment. We have hundreds of reporters spread across the country. These circles represent our News Nation network of stations. And tonight we are also following the soon to be governor of New York, Kathy Hochul, addressing her state for the first time since Andrew Cuomo's decision to step down, conveying confidence, but also distancing herself from the disgraced governor. And a contentious school board meeting in Virginia, ending with one teacher quitting on the spot over a new pronoun policy for transgender students. News Nation live tonight as that school board now votes on the proposal. And an Oklahoma man escapes police custody, steals an ATV, and leads officers on a wild chase, all of it caught on camera. You have to see how this finally comes to an end. And new tonight out of California, Governor Gavin Newsom now requiring all teachers and school staff to get the vaccine or undergo weekly COVID testing. The first state in the nation to impose a statewide mandate will delve into vaccines and hospitalizations later in the hour. But we begin tonight with the ongoing nationwide fight over masks. From classrooms to restaurants to airplanes, new band-aids popping up from coast to coast as COVID cases climb. But the debate over mask requirements, anything but new. News Nation's Marky Martin live tonight in Dallas. Marky, you've been following some of the most contentious mask battles across the country. So what are you finding tonight? Nicole, as COVID continues to surge across the country, this fight over mask mandates, even vaccine mandates, is growing hot. We're talking about from school board meetings to airplanes. The country is really in this coverage chaos right now. And I want to start off with this school board meeting from last night. This is out of Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. Take a look at this. They, we know who you are. We know who you are. Keep it calm. No more masks. Keep it calm. Keep it calm. No more masks. We're on these guys' side. They're no. on our side. No, they're not. They're not no, on our no, side. The police are on our side. The police, the police are on our side. Yeah, just sparked hysteria. What you're seeing here, hundreds of anti-maskers surrounding police, even masked health care workers, after the Williamson County School Board decided to keep masks on campus at elementary schools through September. You had some of those parents yelling, we will not comply. Even there's a special place in hell for you. Some of them even chasing cars off the lot. Now, here in Texas, there's also quite the legal battle. Some of our biggest districts here in the state, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, even Fort Worth as of this morning, deciding to keep masks on campus in direct defiance with Governor Greg Abbott, who earlier this year banned any sort of state-wide mask mandate. And Nicole, a lot of attorneys coming forward saying, you know, according to the Constitution, these school boards have this kind of decision-making power in their hands. Nicole. All right, so Mark, we know, of course, though, it's not just in schools, this battle over masks also brewing in the skies. What can you tell us about that? You know, at, at this point, we've all seen those viral videos of unruly passengers on board airplanes. And in fact, a lot of airlines even coming forward to saying this kind of behavior has just gotten out of control. Well, this week, the FAA sharing new numbers that there are almost 3,000 cases of passengers either at airports or even mid-flight uh, who have decided that they're not going to wear a mask, kind of like this guy just yesterday in Austin, Texas. I'm a free American. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to walk around without it until someone throws me out. And Nicole, just once again to reiterate with COVID now surging once again, we can't expect these kinds of outbursts, these kinds of fights to continue for quite some time. Nicole. Oh, yes, they will. All right, Marky, thank you. Well, mask mandates have turned into, of course, a political issue reaching the White House. The Biden administration trading jabs with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who again today vowed to outlaw any type of mask mandate in his state. Let's throw it to News Nation's Brian Enton live in South Florida. Brian, this is just the latest chapter in this ongoing war of words. Oh, yeah, Nicole, the back and forth, it continued today. Masks, they really have become the politics of the pandemic, especially here uh, in Florida. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has made clear that he is banning any sort of mask mandate in schools in the state of Florida. That has not gone over well with President Biden. And he has now said that he's looking into whether the federal government could intervene in Florida. 
He says he doesn't think they have the power to do it, but he said they're going to look into that. That didn't go over well with Governor DeSantis. He says the state will fight the federal government if they have to. Our war uh, is not on DeSantis. It's on the virus, uh, which we're trying to kneecap. Uh, and uh, he does not seem to want to participate in that effort to kneecap the virus. Our view is, of course, that, that we believe this is a decision for the parent uh, to make, just given the, the uncertainty about what it means, particularly for a lot of the young kids, to, to be in that. Here in Florida, there are several school districts that are defying the governor and say they will have a mask mandate, including Broward County. We're uh, in front of their district headquarters right now. I just spoke with several uh, of the school board members. The governor has threatened to take their salaries, and the school board members today said, bring it on. Nicole? All right, Brian, thank you. All right, let's shift to weather now. Right now, a dangerous heat wave moving across the United States, bringing record temperatures. This is a live look from Portland, Oregon, where the temperature, 95 degrees. Now in St. Louis, an excessive heat warning in effect. The temperature there, right now, 93. And the same story in New York City. Right now, the temperature in the Big Apple, sitting at 90 degrees. News Nation has crews spread out across the nation tonight. Our coverage kicks off tonight in Denver. Hey, I'm meteorologist Chris Tomer in Denver, Colorado. We've got smoky, hot conditions here in Denver, headed for a near record high today, around 97. I'm meteorologist John Fuller in St. Louis, where triple digit heat and heat indices really a threat across the area, affecting some businesses and outdoor plans. The heat advisory for outlying areas, the excessive heat warning for the urban unit, but heat indices as high as 110 with temperatures reaching close to the century mark. Temperatures across central Arkansas once again in the upper 90s, but when you factor in the humidity, those heat index values close to 105, but at least some relief on the way for the weekend. I'm Lindsay Natteridge here in Portland, Oregon, where it's currently 90 degrees, but we're expected to hit triple digits tomorrow and Friday. During the extreme heat wave at the end of June, the city saw dozens of deaths. So this time around, the city says they've opened additional cooling centers and are doing more outreach to keep people safe. All right, let's get to Chief Meteorologist Albert Ramon live in our weather center. Albert, just so hot. Any parts of the country are going to get some relief? Not until the weekend when we get some cooler air coming in out of Canada. But you heard it from our News Nation reporters. It's not just the air temperature, it's the humidity, and it's that dreaded heat index that's making it feel brutal out there. Some of the hottest temperatures right now in terms of heat index in the state of Missouri, Kansas City in the last hour, a heat index of 111. It's 109, the feel like temperature right now. Not just the Midwest, not just the Northeast, but look at this, Pacific Northwest. Widespread in purple, those are excessive heat warnings in orange heat advisories. Portland right now at 97, near a record in the city of Portland as we head into Friday. Let's start in the Pacific Northwest. Three-day forecast, triple digits next two days in Portland. You get out to Redding, California, as hot as 109 for tomorrow. And then off towards the east, look at these temperatures. I'll back up. Temperatures coming down in the city of Chicago. But temperatures in Kansas City tomorrow feeling like 105, feeling like 110 in D.C. tomorrow once you factor in the humidity. So a bit of a break this weekend, but next two days going to be pretty hot, Nicole. Oh, yeah, so hot. Albert, thank you. We're breaking right now a Virginia school board meeting to vote on a policy that would expand the rights of transgender students. Last night, the Loudoun board recessed before the vote after protests and an on-the-spot resignation of a teacher. This isn't the first time tensions over transgender policies have caused issues. We first brought you the story in June when the school board meeting had to be closed to public comment due to unruly behavior by attendees while speakers were making their case. One man even arrested. News Nation's Felicia Bolton joining us now. So Felicia, bring us up to date on where this vote stands right now. Well, Nicole, the Loudoun County School Board re reconvened just about 30 minutes ago, and that vote could happen any minute now. The debate over the treatment of transgender students causing a lot of controversy there, creating a really great divide in that community. And last night, it caused that teacher to quit her job. Take a look for yourself. School board, I quit. I quit your policies, I quit your trainings, and I quit being a cog in a machine that tells me to push highly politicized agendas on our most vulnerable constituents, the children. 
That was the voice of Laura Morris. She's a fifth grade teacher at Luckett's Elementary School. She resigned in front of the school board, saying the measure is politically motivated and against her religious beliefs. Last night's public comments were made in a nearly empty meeting room. That's because new security procedures are limiting the number of people allowed in the administration building. The change came after that June board meeting ended in total chaos, and that was the last time this issue was discussed. Now, let me explain to you the proposal. This is what went before the school board. It would allow transgender student athletes to participate on teams based on the gender they identify with. Teachers and staff would be required to refer to students by their preferred pronouns. Also, transgender students would use bathrooms and locker rooms based on their gender identity as well. And yesterday, there was about four and a half hours of public comment from opponents and also supporters of the measure before calling that recess. Tonight, there will be no public comment on this issue, just board discussion ahead of the vote. Nicole? We know you'll keep an eye on it. All right, Felicia, thank you. The White House taking aim at rising gas prices in America and another case of road rage ending in a death. But we start with this wild video out of Oklahoma City. This is a man evading police on an ATV. And officers say they actually had him in custody before this all unfolded. News Nation's Jacqueline Chapel from our Oklahoma station KFOR explains what happened. This all started when an already handcuffed suspect escaped police custody in eastern Oklahoma County, going on to steal an ATV to use as his getaway vehicle. I can tell you that this guy possibly has one handcuff on one of his hands. I believe they had him in custody at one time. He stole either this four-wheeler or another one, but has been driving all over the north side of of the city right now. The man behind the wheel now identified as Lucas Strider, leading law enforcement on a high speed pursuit Tuesday afternoon, spanning two counties. Strider barreling through the streets of an Oklahoma City suburb, eventually heading one county north. The ATV reaching speeds over 70 miles per hour, with police using tactics to force him into the mud. Oh, nice, nice. Before wiping out in muddy water, Strider quickly lying face down in the mud and dirt, surrendering to police, and later booked into the Oklahoma County Jail. Jones police say he was initially in custody for grand larceny charges, but now he'll be facing additional charges for eluding police. Back to you, Nicole. All right, Jacqueline, thank you. All right, now let's turn to News Nation's Nancy Liu, live in California for more trouble on the road. And Nancy, we're seeing a lot more car chaos across America. Absolutely. CHP and law enforcement agencies all across America responding to far more road rage incidents all over the country and many, many cases have ended tragically. <laughs> Just this weekend here in Southern California, road rage led to the death of 23-year-old Krista Nichols, who was eight months pregnant with her second son. There were passengers in a GMC pickup, which was cut off by another vehicle in Long Beach. Road rage stretched on for blocks before reckless driving led to the deadly crash into a third vehicle. A witness captured much of it on her cell phone. The way they were driving, something's going to happen. Like, I just felt something was going to happen, and it did. In another recent incident captured on dash cam near Near Seattle, a man hurled an axe at another driver who had exited I-5 to avoid confrontation. The Jeep also exited and blocked the victim before the axe throw. Surveillance video led to the man's arrest three days later. Just a few months ago, six-year-old Aiden Laos was killed in a road rage incident along the 55 freeway in Orange County. His mother was cut off by another driver. She allegedly used a hand gesture, and a man in the other vehicle opened fire. Two people were arrested in that incident, including a 24-year-old man who faces a murder charge. Now, there are no national statistics on road rage incidents, but the National Traffic Highway Safety Administration estimates that incidents led to more than 500 deaths in 2019 alone. Nicole? I hate to see that young mother killed and the man with the axe. I'm still a little confused by that. All right. Nancy, thank you. Well, in addition to rage, another major issue on the road, of course, the cost to fill up your tank. Gas prices skyrocketing in recent months. And the Biden administration's message today, we're working on it, but it's not our fault. News Nation's Joe Khalil live tonight in D.C. So, Joe, the White House not taking the blame. Who is the administration pointing the finger at? 
Yeah, and to be clear, Nicole, they understand the criticism they're getting for spending and for worries about inflation generally. But yeah, the Biden administration acknowledged that gas prices increasing is a problem today, partly pointing the finger of blame at OPEC, the cartel of uh, countries that are oil producing countries. The president says that they've been keeping production low, and that has caused an increase in the price. Uh, his national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, today put out a uh, memo that says while OPEC recently agreed to offset production increases, those increases are not offset by production cuts that OPEC had during the pandemic. And he says during this global recovery, that is simply not enough. The president today also said that his administration is going to be playing watchdog on oil companies as well for price gouging. He says that the price for a barrel of oil has gone down and gas prices should be following that. But so far, they're not. Here's the president. That's not what you'd expect in a competitive market. I want to make sure that nothing stands in the way of oil price declines leading to lower prices for consumers. Now, there's a report that in the last year, prices for all goods have gone up about five and a half percent. The president put a positive spin on that, saying at least in the last couple of months, it has been going down. But his critics say that it's actually his agenda and pushing these trillion dollar packages through Congress that is causing this potential inflation and rise in prices. Oh, yeah, definitely seeing that rise here in Chicago. Joe, thank you. We have some new video tonight. This is out of Afghanistan, now exactly one month away from the scheduled U.S. troop withdrawal deadline. Afghan soldiers seen here surrendering to Taliban militants as they continue claiming more territory. Now take a look at this map. The area in red shows the land the Taliban controlled back in April. But now fast forward to today. You can see how much ground the militant group has gained in just about five months. News Nation's Allison Harris live tonight in Washington. Now, Allison, you sat down with the Afghan ambassador to the U.S. today for this exclusive interview. It's her first with an American network. Allison, what is she asking of the United States? Well, Nicole, this ambassador to the U.S., Adela Raz, says the withdrawal of U.S. troops has been quick and it has created some consequences. But she believes with the help of U.S. air power, there is still hope for her country. The Taliban have taken over nine of 35 capitals in the country. Today, the ambassador tells me she wants more U.S. firepower, close air support, even after U.S. ground forces pull out at the end of this month, saying that this war is growing more intense by the day. She says the air support being provided right now is extremely limited, and she wants more help defending Afghan officials against Taliban assassins, saying the killings are threatening the government's backbone. Ambassador Raz is also calling on the U.S. and allies to reimpose sanctions like travel bans on more Taliban leaders. She says, point blank, there is now a humanitarian crisis happening in her country as Afghans are being killed, watching their homes and their livelihoods being destroyed and fleeing in the face of the Taliban advance. We asked her, can you win? Can Afghanistan turn the tide on this Taliban takeover on its own? Ever been able globally, if we eliminate the case of Afghanistan, to make peace with a terrorist group? Do we have one example? That begs the question. The president continues to say that there is a political solution here. Do you think that that's possible? We, ha we have to have a hope, right, to move on. I think the start of the negotiation was with that hope to come to a political solution. But we have to be also cautious that we should not put all our eggs in one basket and assuming that there would be a political solution. We have to prepare for the possibility, what if there is no political solution? To reiterate, she is posing that question, what if there is no political solution? With the Taliban clearly gaining uh, the upper hand on the battlefield, there are no signs that it is ready to talk. That's why she says more sanctions should be imposed. The U.S. should provide more air cover, with President Biden making it clear that he will not change his mind on this withdrawal, telling the Afghan army that they must fight for themselves. Today, his spokeswoman says the U.S. will continue to provide air support, but the Pentagon says that n might not always be feasible. Nicole? All right, Allison, yes, such a contentious situation.
All right, we move to New York now, where the state is moving forward from Governor Andrew Cuomo after his decision to resign over that sexual harassment scandal. Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul said to be the first woman to leave the state, and today she pledged to be better than her predecessor. News Nation's Tom Negevin live for us tonight in New York City. So, Tom, how does she characterize her working relationship with Governor Cuomo? You're about to hear all about that, Nicole. Now, Kathy Hochul getting right to it today, saying, Change is coming. Staff changes, among others, very quickly working to distance herself from Governor Andrew Cuomo before she assumes the state's highest office 13 days from now, reminding reporters who have been covering this ongoing scandal that she and the governor were never particularly close, saying she made a point of traveling the state, being away from Albany, bringing the concerns of New Yorkers back to the state capitol, from which she addressed reporters today, very dramatically distancing herself from the soon-to-be former governor on August the 3rd. The Day the state attorney general's report came out accusing Andrew Cuomo of sexually harassing 11 women, at least 11 women, nine of them state employees. She called uh, the governor's behavior repulsive and unlawful and said, No one is above the law. I think it's very clear that the governor and I have not been close, um, physically or otherwise, in terms of uh, much time. And so I've been traveling the state and do not spend much time uh, in his presence or in the presence of many in the state capitol. But that is what has been re being reported. And I'm going to stand right here. At the end of my term, whenever it ends, no one will ever describe my administration as a toxic work environment. And while continuing to distance herself from the Cuomo administration, she also defended some of its accomplishments. Many people uh, praised Andrew Cuomo. He became uh, a bit of a national, even international icon for a time, as you'll recall, for his stewardship of New York State through the dark early days of the COVID pandemic before his dramatic fall from grace. Lieutenant Governor Hochul says she spoke to him yesterday, thanked him for his service. He promised a smooth transition, she says, as she becomes New York State's 57th governor, the first woman to hold the role. Nicole? All right, the first woman. All right, Tom, thank you. All right, let's head to Texas now, give you a live look at the Texas Capitol, where this House Sergeant at Arms delivered civil arrest warrants for state Democrats today. Those 52 warrants are in response to Democrats who fled the state during special session to break quorum and stop legislation they say would restrict voters. But Republicans already in a second session, hoping to push their bill through. News Nation's Maggie Glenn with our Austin station KXAN joining us live. So, Maggie, tell us what happens next. So, Nicole, last night our Republican Speaker of the House here in Texas officially signed those civil arrest warrants for the 52 Democrats who are still absent from the House floor. So today I actually got to walk with the House Sergeant at Arms as he delivered those warrants to the offices of those Democrats. Obviously, all of them weren't there, so he would s simply hand it to either a staffer or slide it under their doors. And then what he's going to do is report back to the Speaker's office with a list of who was absent. Again, we're expecting all 52 of them to be gone from the Capitol today. And then the Speaker has the power to then depend on local or state law enforcement officials to go around the state and physically arrest these Democrats. Now, remember, it's a civil arrest, so they're not going to be taking them to jail. They're just going to be taking them back to the Capitol. Okay, so, so not to jail. Now, we know that one of the representatives from Houston, Gene Wu, he's saying that he's acquired a restraining order against the warrant. So that's essentially barring law enforcement from an, any arrest. So uh, how complicated is this in the court system? Well, in short, uh, it's extremely complicated, and it keeps changing by the hour. Um, earlier this week on Monday, we saw a Travis County, that's right here in Austin, um, a Travis County judge bar the governor and um, uh, our state officials from being able to arrest those Democrats. But then the governor and the speaker sent that decision to our Texas Supreme Court, who then overturned that decision. So. It's really complicated. It's constantly changing, and we're expecting that same overturn um, with Representative Wu's case as well. All right, Maggie Glenn keeping us updated on a very convoluted issue. Thank you. All right, next on Rush Hour, this video made national headlines, appearing to show a sheriff's deputy overdosing on fentanyl. Some health experts, though, were skeptical, and now the sheriff himself saying there was no overdose. Plus, murder charges for two coaches after a high school athlete died of heat stroke during a practice.
Remember this body cam footage of a San Diego police officer supposedly overdosing because of fentanyl. We showed it to you last week. And new tonight, there is a new public scrutiny after a comment from the county sheriff. News Nation's Kasha Gregorchek from our San Diego, San Diego station KSWB is live. So, Kasha, there is now this debate over whether it's even real. Nicole, that is right, and the sheriff is now coming forward himself saying he assumed that the deputy's exposure to fentanyl is what caused that supposed overdose you saw in that video. The sheriff's department now saying they are vowing to release the full body camera footage of that day where the deputy comes in close contact with the fentanyl. This is after the sheriff received sharp criticism. Health experts have come forward to challenge that video, saying overdose from just skin contact or inhaling fentanyl is extremely unlikely. So instead, researchers have found first responders can experience what they call the nocebo effect. That means they can experience what appears to be the effects of a drug while under the stress of coming into close contact with it. Now, the department initially released the video last week as a public service announcement warning about the dangers of fentanyl, which is 50 times more potent than heroin. And again, along with promising that full release of the body camera video of that day. They're also saying they're going to seek medical records from the deputy to really get to the bottom of exactly what caused that medical episode. You saw we are awaiting both the medical report and the video for now. Back to you, Nicole. All right, yeah, so the nocebo effect. All right, Kasha, thank you. Well, still ahead, ICU beds filling up across the country as COVID cases climb and more hospitals reporting children are in those beds and on ventilators. News Nation goes inside a children's hospital next. Welcome back. Here's what's happening in your nation right now. New developments in the case of a Chicago cop gunned down. The man accused of providing the gun to the suspects facing a judge, while the mayor doubles down on her push to support police. And a pair of high school basketball coaches facing murder charges two years after one of their players died during a practice. But we begin with those rising number of COVID cases among children. Data from the American Academy of Pediatrics shows more than 93,000 new COVID cases in children over the past week. Now, that's significantly lower. We do want to say that than the pandemic peak of more than 200,000 in January. But here's the thing. That number was below 9,000 in late June. News Nation's Aaron Nolan joining us live from Arkansas Children's Hospital. Aaron, how high are today's COVID cases among children? Well, if we compare this, Nicole, to six weeks ago, five times higher, a 540% increase from what we saw early in July. And you mentioned kind of those numbers and understanding those numbers. We're gonna give them to you right now. The numbers from six weeks ago, roughly five a day of COVID cases behind me at Arkansas Children's Hospital. Today, 27 kids are in the hospital suffering from COVID. And really that's a trend that we're seeing all around the country, particularly here in the South. News Nation was given a deeper look into those numbers here in Arkansas. Nearly half are in the ICU, more than half of those on ventilators. To put that in perspective, today there are more kids on vents than average cases last month. That's a big concern with schools starting this week in many school districts across Arkansas. And this week, again, they're having to make that decision about masks in school. And that's something Dr. Jessica Snowden, who works at Arkansas Children's Hospital as the chief of pediatric infectious disease, tells me she agrees with masks wholeheartedly. There is ample evidence that masking helps decrease the spread of COVID-19, and there is no evidence that it is harmful in any way other than maybe some mask acne. That's it. We can teach young kids to wear a mask, and there is lots of evidence that shows us not just in lab simulated environments that it helps with spread, but actually when you look at the community level, when we have our population masking, there is less COVID-19. It is a small thing that we are asking people to do to protect kids. But I think there is no question from the scientific perspective that kids should be wearing masks in school. So here in Arkansas, none of those children that are currently in Arkansas Children's Hospital, there are two campuses, one here and one in the northwest corner of the state. None of them were vaccinated, although half of them will, 
were eligible. Very quickly, Nicole, I want to go to nearby Mississippi. Dr. Alan Jones, a vice chancellor at the University of Mississippi Medical Sciences, has said he fears the system hospital will not be allowed to take care of kids with COVID. In fact, he tells us that the hospital could be on the verge of a field hospital in about a week. Nicole, back to you. Yeah, very concerning, Aaron. All right, thank you. All right, let's turn to Georgia now, where two high school basketball coaches are now facing murder charges after a player died from heat stroke. And tonight, the victim's parents speaking out nearly two years after their daughter died during an outdoor practice in extreme temperatures. News Nation's Janelle Fort live tonight in Atlanta. Janelle, what is her family saying about these new charges? Well, they're hoping for widespread change. Nicole, this is the first time a coaching staff has been charged for murder in a heat-related death of a student athlete. Friday marks two years since Imani Bell collapsed here at Elite Scholars Academy while running stadiums as a basketball conditioning drill. She was just 16 years old. She was starting her junior year of high school. And court records, they show that the heat index that day exceeded 100 degrees. A heat advisory had been issued, but the girls' basketball coaches still had their team conditioning outside. Records say Amani struggled through that workout, holding the railing for balance before losing consciousness while running stairs. She was rushed to the hospital. She died just hours later. Amani's autopsy says her death was heat-related. Yesterday, a grand jury indicted two of Amani's basketball coaches her head coach, LaRosa Walker, a scary, and her assistant coach, Dwight Palmer, they're charged with second-degree murder, second-degree child cruelty, and voluntary manslaughter and reckless conduct for having those kids working out in the dangerous heat. Imani had no underlying issues. She didn't have any heart problems or diabetes or anything like that. She was a fully healthy young lady. So this specific incident and this amount of heat just took her out just like that. So... You know, when a coach or a person um, in, a, in a position of authority sees a kid struggling, you have to know, listen, that kid's health is way more important than you winning a game or getting a team ready for a season. Now, we've tried unsuccessfully to reach both of those coaches and their attorneys. Uh, both are out on a $75,000 bond. Monty's family also has a civil suit in this case. And we reached out to the school district. When we did, they told us that they do not comment on pending litigation or personnel matters. Nicole. That's, I mean, it's hard enough just to walk outside when it's extreme, you know, extremely hot, let alone work out. All right, Janelle, thank you. Still ahead tonight on Rush Hour, a double decision for the future of the hit game show Jeopardy. Not one, but two new hosts announced. The city of Chicago continues mourning the loss of 29-year-old police officer Ella French. She was fatally shot during a traffic stop Saturday night. And today, the man accused of buying the gun used to kill Officer French appeared in federal court. News Nation's Mike Lowe from our Chicago station WGN joining us now with the latest. So, Mike, can you tell us what happened in court today? 29-year-old Jamel Danzi of Hammond, Indiana, is the man you're speaking of, Nicole. He's accused of essentially uh, violating federal firearms laws by uh, engaging in what is called a straw purchase, an illegal purchase of a weapon for someone else. He is alleged to have given that weapon to one of the two Chicago brothers accused in this killing. And today he had his bond hearing. Uh, the federal magistrate in charge of the hearing uh, freed him on bond today, a $4,500 bond with a few conditions uh, that he can't uh, have any contact with the family of either of these officers and he will be under court supervision but he is out on bond tonight right because we know her her partner is still in the hospital all right so he's out on bond 29 year old officer killed what's the mayor's reaction been to all of this well, Mayor Lightfoot has had a little bit of a troubled reaction. Uh, she has viewed 
very controversially by the Chicago police. There's even a report that when she went to visit Officer French's family and the wounded officer, her partner in the hospital, that they turned their backs on her. Today, she sought to sidestep any of the politics involved and simply say that now is the time to focus on the families of the officers, uh, Officer French, who was killed, and her partner, who is still fighting for his life in the hospital. She says now is the time to thank them for their service and keep them in the city's prayers. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our hearts certainly go out to those families. All right, Mike, thank you. Well, later tonight, Cook County State's attorney Kim Fox will join On Balance host Leland Vitter to talk about the Ella French case. It's a big interview. You don't want to miss it. It starts at 8, 7 central right here on News Nation. We still ahead tonight in entertainment double duty on Jeopardy after the show confirms not one, but two new hosts. And did the recent Friends reunion ignite an old flame? David Schremer and Jennifer Anderson responding to rumors they've been spending lots of time together. Time for some entertainment headlines. And after much speculation, Jeopardy! officially has a new host. The show's executive producer, Mike Richards, gets to split the honor with a celebrity. And Chicago Bulls entertainment host, Justin Roman, is with us tonight. So, Justin, what can you tell us about this new setup? Hi, Nicole. Yeah, pretty excited. Executive producer, Mike Richards. He will be the official daily host of the classic game show, Jeopardy! He is obviously replacing legendary uh, host, Alex Trebek. Now, I'll get back to Mike Richards in a second, because also hosting Jeopardy! will be Mayim Bialik from uh, Big Bang Theory. You may know her from Blossom, my old school fans out there. She is also being uh, the host of uh, Jeopardy! Primetime and the spinoff series Jeopardy! College National Tournament. So that's pretty cool. But back to executive producer Mike Richards being the host. Now, if I auditioned for that show, I'd be kind of bummed out because if the executive producer picked himself over me, that's kind of not cool, right? You think you have a hand in picking his host of his show. But anyways, as a diehard Chicago Bears fan, I'm very glad it was not Aaron Rodgers because I couldn't stomach watching Aaron Rodgers on my TV in Chicago every single day. Ouch! Ouch! <laughs> all right, all right, Justin. Well, MTV has announced this year's VMA nominees. We know first-timer Olivia Rodrigo to superstars like Justin Bieber. So tell us who else is nominated. Yeah, so Justin Bieber and Megan Thee Stallion, they both lead all artists with nominations at this year's 2021 MTV Video Music Awards happening on Sunday, September 12th at Brooklyn's Barclays Center. Now, Megan Thee Stallion, she's up for six nominations, including Artist of the Year and four for her song WAP with Cardi B, including Video and Song of the Year. Justin Bieber, he leads all artists with seven nominations, including Artist of the Year, and he has three for his smash song called Peaches. Also, like you said, Olivia Rodrigo, Drake, BTS, um, tons have five nominations, but I will say I can't believe in 2021 a song called WAP is up for song and video of the year. <laughs> Justin, believe it. All right, all right, let's go back to the 90s. All okay. right, a simpler time. Uh, fans of the 90s hit show Friends going wild over rumors two of the show's yeah. stars are dating. So any truth to this whole Jennifer Aniston, David Schwimmer connection? Oh, people are going crazy watching that reunion show because they both admitted, Jennifer Aniston and David Schwimmer, Rachel and Ross, they admitted they had feelings for each other and when they were filming live on the set, I couldn't even believe it. Nobody could believe it, but you you know what? This week it got crazier because, yeah, were they dating? They've been seen together, hanging out. Well, unfortunately, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but a rep from David Schwimmer and Jennifer Aniston have denied both those rumors, unfortunately. So I guess in real life, they are not each other's lobsters after all. And if you don't watch that show, you don't get that reference. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I believe it though. They always deny it, Justin, and then it comes out. Right, like they're married a year later and like, ha, I told exactly. you so, right? Yeah. All right, Justin, great having you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, the Dowling Report starts at the top of the hour. Let's go down to Joe in the studio to tell us what he's working on. Hi, Nicole. Tonight on the Donlin Report, the battle over mask mandates. It's playing out in communities across the country and between two high-level officials in Texas. Both of them join us live tonight. Also, a story you'll see only here. Former NFL players taking the fight for their share of the NFL's concussion settlement to the Department of Justice. They say they're being denied because of race. We'll see you with that much more ahead at the top of the hour. Nicole, back to you. All right. Thank you, Joe. We'll still head tonight on Rush Hour. One more check on top headlines making uh, news across your nation, including a new development and the ongoing push for Donald Trump's past 
tax returns. We continue tonight live from our news station headquarters in Chicago. Here are some top stories we are watching right now. California, the first state in the nation to require all teachers and school staff to be vaccinated or undergo weekly COVID testing. Governor Gavin Newsom made that announcement today. The state seeing a surge in COVID cases because of the Delta variant and it's affected children more than previous strains. California's two largest teachers unions say they fully support Newsom's policy. And a dangerous heat wave scorching parts of the U.S. with millions of Americans in temperatures near triple digits. A heat wave in the Pacific Northwest not only driving up those temps, but also fueling dozens of wildfires. In the Northeast, the heat mixed with humidity, making it feel much hotter. And the National Weather Service says the heat wave expected to last into the weekend. New York Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul says she will set a different tone than Governor Andrew Cuomo. The 62-year-old Democrat held her first news briefing today saying she'll change the work culture in the state's top office. In two weeks, Hochul is set to become the state's first female governor after Cuomo announced his resignation yesterday following the state attorney general's report concluding he sexually harassed 11 women. And former President Donald Trump's accountants must turn over two years of tax records. A federal judge made that ruling today, granting access to the House committee investigating Mr. Trump and his businesses. The access includes records covering 2017 and 2018, but it excludes a request for records dating back to 2011. And Baylor University did not break NCAA rules when it failed to report accusations of sexual assault against members of the football team. The NCAA announcing its decision today, ending an investigation spanning several years after at least 19 players were accused of sexual misconduct. The ruling comes even after several top leaders resigned and the school acknowledged it made mistakes. That is all for Rush Hour tonight. A quick reminder, you can follow me on social media. Just search Nicole Burley on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Have a great Wednesday night.